Well, the time's arrived, the $2 million Eureka, the world's richest harness racing event, when dreams become a reality. And for dreams to start in the first place, there's got to be a few ideas kicked around. Well, joining me is one of the gentlemen who was involved in those ideas and certainly has gone on further, having a horse running in the Eureka. I caught up with Mr. Jamie Dernberger-Smith. Well, Jamie, great to catch up with you. As I said, the Eureka dreams are going to become a reality here at Climate Angle tonight. But the dreams had to start with an idea, and you were involved in some of those discussions. Yeah, it was just a pipe dream for everyone, really. Uh, the gallopers have done it. The dogs have done it. There was no reason why harness racing couldn't do it. Our sport's just an amazing sport that we had to showcase. Uh, the powers to be got together. Uh, we had a bit of input into that, of ideas of how we've seen it run before. And, yeah, the setup now for the Eureka, this is just incredible. The crowd right now is just deafening out there. There's a line-up all the way down a Lucky Lodge. This is just, yeah, what an amazing event. Yeah, the atmosphere is certainly electric, Jamie. I haven't seen people trying to still get into Clubman Angle four races into the meeting. Doesn't it remind you of the last night at Harold Park when it was just absolutely chockers? This is what we needed to get harness racing back to. This event will get it back to that. This is only the beginning. Like, oh, in 10 years' time when we look back, we say, HRA doing this with Clubman Angle, with HRNSW, visionaries to be able to change the game and get it back to what it once was, that would just be the pinnacle for us. What's well, something great about this Eureka so far, Jamie, is the fact that it's captured the imagination of harness racing people, but also non-harness racing people who are here to, probably for the first time. Yeah, definitely. I've got some of my friends that have never been to harness racing before. They're here tonight. Uh, obviously, Singo's been in all forms of racing before, and for him to come back to the game, uh, that's just an amazing feat for everyone's got to give kudos to that that's just amazing to bring them back on also for myself like my family they're into the thoroughbreds they train at Rose Hill Sheree and Lee Curtis they're not really into harness racing but they've gotten behind this they're just one person you can imagine all the stories of people that have never been in the industry before that want to come to an event we've got birds of Tokyo playing after the last this is just going to be just one big party and we get to showcase our sport to all these people so it's amazing Jamie, you've got a rich history in harness racing on so many levels. We're going to discuss those. But the two gentlemen looking over your shoulder, Kevin Robinson, Vic Frost, two of the legends and two outstanding people, kick-started your career. Yeah, so I was just a young fella. My family were in the thoroughbreds when I was younger. Um, started out at a little place called Berry on the south coast, which everyone would know, Kevin Robinson. And Kevin's two children, uh, Christopher Robinson and Terry Robinson, they took me on and go to Harold Park every Friday night with them, every Tuesday. And I pretty much see Chris as like my dad. He's just without him, I would never be where I am today. Um, just great family, great people. They got me the bug. White Thunder winning the APG in Queensland, winning I think it was 13 straight. That just really solidified me in harness racing. Uh, when I would have probably gone down the galloping route, that changed it for me. And yeah, just an amazing family, the Robinsons. Did you ever consider a career as far as training and driving? So I did do a lot of training and driving. Um, I started off with Crystal Robinson. I was with my stepfather, Gregory Minns. I spent about four and a half years with Gary Hall. Um, I come back over to the East Coast and I was with Trevor Lamborn. And then obviously I was with um, Vic Frost for a fair while. Um, yeah, I've been there, done that, done, started from the bottom, try to work my way to the top. And then now just as an owner, as a participant, and just to come to the races and just have fun and bring more people to the sport. This game, it's not very different to the gallops. There's no reason we can't get people into it. And the gallops, it's full of owners. So let's just bring new people in the game, work hard. The harder we work, the luckier we'll become. You touched on a good point there about bringing people into harness racing compared to the galloping industry. One thing it is, it is cheaper to be involved in harness racing. Well, we have this conversation a lot. Harness racing is extremely viable compared to the gallops. Um, training fees are significantly less, generally three to four times cheaper. I know the prize money is a lot less than harness racing, but we race so much more often, so it becomes a lot more viable to be able to own a harness racing horse. Uh, we are just having a chat the other day about how many horses we've got on the books now. We started off four years ago with only two horses we bought, and now we're up to teetering on 400 horses. There's no way that would be able to happen in the gallops because the fees are just so exponential, and they race so not very much, like they so sparingly race throughout the year. So for harness racing and for people that want to get into harness racing, this is, this is the sport to be in. This is a sport where you can go there, every day, average Joe, go there with your $500, jump into a horse, have a lot of fun, and not lose a lot of money. And generally, 
fingers crossed, if you come with us, we'll win money. <laughs> Well, we had to discuss that. Your motto is, I live and breathe harness racing. So how did you make that transition from wanting to be a trainer driver into becoming one of the most influential bloodstock agents in the world? So when I look back on it, I would still love to train and drive. Um, I'm a little bit too big, so I couldn't be a jockey, so I wanted to be a driver. But I felt it's a sport where you've got to really live and breathe it. You can't go and do another another day job and earn money that way. you just got to just go head first in and do it. And for me, I was working in the mines and it just never really got to that stage where I could just leave the mines and then just do that full time. And about four years ago, I met a fellow by the name of Jake Webster out of Gary Halls. He was just there on a, on a, a holiday, come out to Gary Halls and then we were just talking one night and we decided, why can't we just buy a couple of horses, get our mates in and just start from there. We never realised it would turn into this. It just become a greater beast once we got on board with Aaron Bain from Aaron Bain Racing. Uh, he jumped on board when we were about 40 horses and then he really pushed us like I call him the yes man he never says no to a horse whenever we present a horse he's like yep let's buy it so we did that and then we, now we've just grown into an, ex an extreme beast we're in all facets of the game we're breeding close to 30 horses this year we're going down every single route of it yearlings with I'm flying to America in two weeks go to the yearling sales there just live and breathe harness racing and apart from bringing in a lot of new people, you are hands-on in the fact that you do retain shares in all your horses, so you've completely got your eye over everything. Yeah, definitely. We definitely put our money where our mouth is because we have to instill to the people that buy into these horses with us that we're that confident that this is going to work. And, yeah, we definitely will put our money where our mouth is. The one thing I've noticed uh, with, with the horses, Jamie, you leave no stone unturned either. And you've got the best horses, you want the best trainers, you want the best drivers. Yeah, definitely. We've got a lot of horses with a lot of trainers. I think the trainers would be up around about 30 to 40 mark now. Uh, we've got a lot of horses. We've also kids that are just starting out. Um, Amy Cargill and Zach Chapinen, they're doing a great job for us. Lockie Hart up in Queensland. So we like to spread it around. We've also got it with the, the best trainers in the game, Emma Stewart, Luke and Belinda McCarthy. We've got horses with them as well. We try to make sure that we place the horse in the right state with the right trainer to the way that we see the horse. Like, for example, if one's got extreme gait speed, we know it has to go to WA if it's got a low HWE. We take in all the different facets of it and make sure that we place the horses correctly to get the, the right ROI for the for our owners. And when you're looking for horses, you've got to have the breeding side of it, but you also got to have a good eye and no doubt a lot of that gut feeling as well. Yeah, definitely. We we do a lot of work on, it, on this. Um, when it comes to even buying a horse, we go back through the lineages. We spend a lot of time pedigree matching, going down that route. If we would have bought the horse when it was a yearling, even though we're buying it as a tried horse, we take in so many different aspects of it to try to make sure that we mitigate our risk. And I feel like we're doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, of course, exciting time for you as far as the Eureka is concerned in Cypher and in the Len Smith Gold Mile, Spirit of St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, it's super exciting times. Um, Spirit of St. Louis looks at an extremely good chance. He's favorite in this, drawn one. Uh, had a good chat with Linda and Luke earlier during the week. Whether we hold the lead or we hand up, we'll leave it with Jack. He knows what he's doing, so we'll go down that route and hopefully we can jag that one, really start the night off with a bang with a bit of luck. And then we've got Cypher in the, the Eureka. Now, she's a bit of a smoky here because if she's sitting 1-1 one, one on the back of Leap to Fame, we know she can follow high speed. She raced the open boys last week and she beat them. We're very, very confident that she can really give us a good shake with the right run. You're a little bit disappointed that the uh, champ, Charles Oliveri, wasn't able to get here to be the ambassador, the UFC champ. Hopefully next year he will be here at Club and Angle. Yeah, it was a bit strange. It, it hurt us a little bit. Um, there was only one clause in the contract that stated if Charles got a title fight, that he would have to then forego his position here. And Dana White called him on to do a title fight. So we wish him all the best. We hope he wins the title. He's gone into a six to eight week training camp now and then we're still in talks with him that ball hasn't been dropped we'll definitely be attempting to bring him here next year and hopefully dana white does intervene again well james it's been great to catch up with you summer bloodstock doing wonderful things on a worldwide stage the eureka is now on a worldwide stage so everything's looking very positive as far as harness racing is concerned harness racing is the only sport to be in thank you mick